Okay, the session is being recorded, guys. Okay, what is a hypothesis uh, testing? It is, if you have the handout, please have it ready and you can follow uh, with me using your handout. If not, I'm gonna share this one uh, with my notes on it as well. It's a process that uses information from a sample to test a claim about the value of a population parameter. For example, I could make, I could make a claim that uh, the percentage of students who get an A in my statistics class is more than 30%. Now this is a claim. You would have to verify the claim and this is why we per, when we perform hypothesis testing. There are five steps to perform the test and then at the very end you can say whether your claim is valid or not valid and this is what you guys are gonna learn throughout the process. Here's another example. An automobile manufacturer advertises that its new hybrid car has a mean mileage of 50 miles per gallon. This is very serious claim. They're telling you that you can get 50 miles per gallon if you buy their car. Now to test this claim, you would collect a sample. If the sample mean differs enough from the advertised mean, you can decide probably the advertisement is false. So for example, if they say that the car does 50 miles per gallon, and then we go and take 30 cars, and we see how many miles per gallon each car does, and at the very end, we arrive at an average of 37. Well, you can probably, guys, have a good feeling that they're wrong in their advertisement. But if we arrive at an average close to 50, probably you have to say that their advertisement is uh, correct. But how do you do that? It's a process. That's what you're going to learn uh, today and tomorrow. In, in reality, guys, we don't know we don't know what the true value of a population parameter is. We don't know what the true mean. We don't know what the true standard deviation, although we assume sometimes that we know the population standard deviation, but in real life, we don't know. So for example, do we know what's the average age of a person in the United States whose age is between, uh, like uh, every salary of uh, people who work in industries in the United States? We don't know that because you will have to go to every single industry and every single worker and get their data added up and then divide by the number of people and that's almost impossible. We only obtain information about the population when we do the census and yet with the census we still miss hundreds of thousands of people. So in real life we don't know what the true parameters are. When I say parameters I'm talking about population mean, population proportion, which you learned in chapter six, and then population standard deviation. So those parameters must be estimated. However, we can perform a hypothesis test to check on their true values. Okay, what is a statistical hypothesis? So we're gonna have quite a bit of definitions here, guys, today. So please bear with me and try to understand the definitions. What I'm gonna to do today, the hypothesis testing is five steps. I'm gonna focus on step one. I want you to walk out, you know, just of this lesson today, mastering the first step, which we're gonna start in a minute. What is a statistical hypothesis? It's a statement or a claim about a population parameter. You should carefully state a pair of hypotheses. So when we do a statistical hypothesis test, we state two statements. One that represents the claim and one that represents the total opposite of the claim. So the first statement, guys, is called null hypothesis. And the other one is called the alternative, the total opposite. So for example, if someone go into court for, uh, to be tried for a crime, the attorney for this person is gonna make the statement that the person is not guilty and try to defend this statement. What do you think the prosecutor uh, hypothesis is going to be? 
can someone tell me? So the defendant attorney will make the statement that my client is not guilty. What do you guys think the prosecutor's statement would be? Can someone share with us? Yes, the prosecutor is going to try to prove that the person is guilty. That's exactly so. Two statements, they're fighting each other. And do you guys know who wins at the very end? What do they say when they make, you know, a conclusion and a verdict? The one who collects evidence, enough evidence beyond what? If they collect evidence, enough evidence to convict or to acquit the person, but the evidence have to be beyond what? That starts with R, the word. Beyond reasonable doubt. And this is exactly how it's going to work in hypothesis testing. If you collect evidence, enough evidence, beyond reasonable doubt to support one statement over another, that statement would win exactly as in the justice system. So I'm gonna be using the justice system as an example to mimic the hypothesis testing idea, guys. Okay, null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a statistical hypothesis that contain a statement of equality. So the null hypothesis guys can have this equal sign, less than or equal sign or greater than or equal sign. It has to have the equal sign in it. So it's one of the three. It is denoted by H with an O or a zero. And it, it's read H sub zero or H, H naught. The null hypothesis denoted HO often represents the status quo. That's what we have, the prior knowledge. So the previous belief, this is the no effect. This is what the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis contains the signs. This, let's write them down. That or equal. Alternative hypothesis. This is the total opposite of the null hypothesis. A statement of inequality such as greater than, not equal to, or less than. If the null hypothesis, guys, is false, then we can conclude that the alternative hypothesis is true because they're opposite of each other. So if the first one is false, the second one is a true. This statement must be true if HO is false. It is denoted by HA. A stands for alternative, guys, and it's read H sub A. This hypothesis is assumed to be true when the null hypothesis is false. Both the null and the alternative hypothesis should be stated before any statistical test of significance. So your first step, guys, when you perform a hypothesis test is to state the null and the alternative hypothesis. In other words, you technically are not supposed to do data analysis first and then decide on the hypothesis afterwards. If you learned it from schools, guys, and you wanna study something and you have a project, you have to state the hypothesis first. Uh, so in summary, the alternative hypothesis denoted HA is usually what we seek evidence for. So usually we try to put the claim in the alternative hypothesis if we wanna seek support for it. So the alternative hypothesis contains the following signs. I'm just repeating them. So you got greater than, less than, or not equal to. Okay, here's a question for you guys. If I have an equal in the null hypothesis, what would be the alternative uh, sign? The total opposite sign. Can you guys help me with this? Uh, equal sign with the line in the middle? You guys can see the screen. I got, uh, I got uh, a student telling me they don't see the shared screen. So if you have equal sign in the null hypothesis, it will be not equal in the alternative. If you have less than or equal to in the null hypothesis, it will be greater than in the alternative. If you have a greater than or equal to, it will be less than in the alternative. 
alternative. And don't worry, guys, we have, we're going to do tons of examples on how to state those. But you should know that they come in pairs. These two together, these two together, and these last two together. This is called HO here, and this is called HA. Okay. The ma major purpose of a hypothesis test, guys, is to choose between two competing hypotheses about the value of a population parameter. What do you mean by two competing hy hypotheses, HO and HA? For, for example, one hypothesis might claim that the wages of men and women are equal, well, while the other one could claim that the uh, wages are not equal. That could be, these are two competing hypotheses. And whatever hypothesis you can collect enough evidence to support, that will be the one that wins at the very end. Hypothesis actually to be tested is usually given by the simple HO and is commonly referred to as a null hypothesis. So you see guys, I always come back to the null hypothesis. We assume that the null hypothesis is always true until proven otherwise. Just like in the court system guys, when someone is being tried for something wrong they did, the court cannot assume that the person is guilty. They assume to begin with that the person is not guilty to begin with. Otherwise, if they make an assumption that the person is guilty already, why try in the person if you already think that he or she is guilty? So they make an assumption that the person is not guilty and whomever collect enough evidence beyond reasonable doubt to even keep this assumption or go against this assumption will win the case. And it's the same thing for hypothesis testing. We assume that null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. Next, some more definition and we'll get, okay. Uh, we'll get uh, to the heart of it in a few minutes. We will reject HO, guys, the null hypothesis, and support HA if the data provide convincing evidence against HO. So in order to reject HO, you have to have enough evidence to reject it. If you don't have enough evidence to reject it, you cannot reject it. Uh, and just in the court system, uh, guys, if they cannot reject that the person is not, uh, uh, is guilty, they have to say that we don't have enough evidence to prove that the person is guilty and therefore the person or the defendant is not guilty. But they ever declare innocence in the court system. They say that the person is not uh, guilty. It doesn't mean that the person is innocent. Most likely, probably it is, but they say not guilty. They never say innocence. Now, in order to collect this evidence that I'm talking about, you have to have a sample. And from a sample, we're gonna get what we call a test statistic. And based on the value of this test statistic, guys, I'm gonna show you how can you reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis uh, later. So this is gonna come later. Okay, I'm gonna go to the second page. Um, let me explain this bullet here. Let's say, let's say someone, as, as we said, guys, in the car, the hybrid car case, the manufacturer makes a claim that the car can do 50 miles per hour. Then you collect data and then you come up with an average that is uh, 28 miles per hour. This is too far from 50, guys. So probably you have convincing evidence to reject the manufacturer claim because your 28 uh, is too far from 50. But this is just to have an idea without doing the hypothesis test. But with the steps that we're gonna do, you're gonna learn how to go one, two, three, four, five, and at the very end say, I reject the claim or I support the claim. So we will learn all of this. 
To write the null and the alternative hypothesis translate the claim made about the population parameter from a verbal statement to a mathematical statement. So the possible statements are gonna be, guys, we will be testing the mean, the population mean. So you always begin like this. I'm gonna do the three choices that we did earlier and show you what is it gonna be in each case. Let's say if I put the mean equals 15 here, I'm just making this up. Can someone tell me what would the alternative be here? Not equal. Not equal, excellent. Okay, let's say here I put less than or equal 15. Can you guys tell me what would it be in HA? More than. Greater than. Yep. And let's say here the other choice I have is to put greater than or equal to 15. What would be the alternative? Less than. Less than. Guys, these are the three groups that you have to use. You either gonna write this in your problem, definitely not 15, it depends, whatever the statement is about. Or this one, guys, or that one. There are no other choices other than those three, guys. So your statement, your step number one, it's gonna be either this, or that, or that, when you are testing the mean. When we test the proportion, instead of a mu, we put P, and it will be remain the same, and same. It has it be either equal, not equal together, less than or greater, uh, less than or equal to with greater, or greater than uh, or equal to with less. And you're gonna see it right now, guys, with the practice. Now it, we're just gonna do some practice, so I can, uh, I can just show what I've been talking about. Express the following statements using algebraic expressions, equations, or inequalities. Use mu for mean, sigma for standard deviation, and p for proportion. And then write another statement that is opposite to the original. So we will translate what's given to us, guys, and then we'll write the opposite statement. And I'm gonna do one more thing. Uh, I wanna identify which statement is called HO and which statement is called HA. So let's go one step further. The mean ID score is less than 120. Would you guys agree with me that it should be mean less than 120 like that? Support that? Okay. Can someone tell me what's the opposite statement to this one? Greater than 120? Uh, you missed by a little bit. Greater than or equal to? Greater than or equal to, because there is no equal in the original statement. There must be an equal in the other one. Okay, I'll put opposite here. Okay. What do we call the first one, guys? H-O or H-A? H-O. H-O. Uh, no, you guys, you're thinking it is H-O because it came first. But remember, H-O has only equal, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. So this turns out not to be H-O, guys. It is what? H-A. H-A. And then the other one must be H-O. Remember, we're not putting them in order. We're just writing what he says and then writing the opposite. Okay, let's do the second one. A transportation company claims that the mean waiting time for pickup is less than 15 minutes. So would you guys agree with me? It's less than 15 minutes like that. What would be the alternative? Or not the alternative, the opposite. Greater than or equal to? Yes. And you guys, this is again called HA. We usually put HO first, but for the sake of this problem, he put, he gave us the first, uh, the second one first. The standard deviation of test scores is no more than 4.5. Do you guys know what no more means in mathematics? At most. Yes, which is? What's the sign for at most? Less than or equal to? You got it. 
This happened to be HO, guys. Remember, HO has those signs. I'm gonna keep writing them until you get bored of them. And HA has one of those signs. We cannot change them. These are the ones. Okay, guys, so let's see. Uh, what's the opposite? What's the opposite to less than or equal to? Greater than. Greater than. And again, this is called HA, guys. A school administrator claims that the proportion of students who score 1,300 or more on the SAT test is 55%. Okay, I'll wait for help from your side, guys. How do I write this? What letter do I begin with? Is it mu, p, or sigma? Mu, p. Or sigma. He says proportion. So let's see. P, I agree. Is 55%, so equal 55%, guys. That should be easy for you to tell me what's the opposite here. What is the opposite of this one? P is what? What's the opposite to equal sign? Not equal. Not equal. Yep. I cannot emphasize how important, guys, what we're doing right now. You will see just five steps, guys, and we're pretty much done. So equal 55%, not equal 55%. Okay, what about the next one? The mean cost of a new computer is more than $1,200. Mean, more than 1,200. You can put the unit if you want. And what would be the opposite here? Less than or equal to 1,200. You got it. And this happened to be HA, and that one happened to be HO. When you start doing uh, problems, guys, later, you just do HO first and HA uh, second. But I'm just following what he says here. An engineer made a hypothesis that the mean a brittle hardness of all such ductile iron piece is greater than 170. See the word mean? That's it. That tells you what simple you have to use. Greater than 170, guys. I think you agree with me. It's this. And that turns out to be HA. Then HO. If you agree, if you don't agree, tell me, please. I'll explain less than or equal to 170. Next one. A manufacturer claims that the thickness of the spearmint gum it produced is 7.5, one hundredth of an inch. Thickness is a quantity, it's not a proportion, so it's a mean. What is it gonna be, guys? They claim it is 7.5, one hundredth of an inch. Equal to. Equal to. And then the other statement will be. Not equal to. This is HO. This is HA. Now, if you guys go on YouTube to watch some videos on hypothesis testing, instead of HA, some books called the alternative hypothesis as H1. Because the null hypothesis is H sub zero, and they call the other one H sub one. Okay, let's move on. More exercises. The reason why I have it quite a bit here, because it's very important. If you don't know how to state step one of the hypothesis test, everything else is going to relate to step one and will be wrong if we don't master this step. The proportion of flights that are delayed does not exceed 15%. So P.
does not exceed 15%. What would you say, guys? Less than 15. Less than or equal, equal to. That turns out to be HO. So HA. It will be, what's the opposite sign, guys, of less than or equal to? We talked about it. It's a greater than. Greater than. Yeah. Here, guys, the claim happened to be in HO. Your claim, the claim doesn't have to be in HA all the time. It can be in either one. But in real life, if you really want to work in favor of your claim and support of your claim, you make sure that your claim fills, uh, falls in the alternative hypothesis. We claim that the mean nightly hotel price for hotels in South Carolina is no more than 65. Mean. What's no more than 65, guys? Just to get used to those. No more means what? Less than or equal to. So it will be here. That's no more. And that's a greater than 65. Okay. Practice two. Write the claim as a mathematical sentence, state the null and the alternative hypothesis, and identify which one represents the claim. A school publicizes that the proportion of its students who are involved in at least one extracurricular activities is 61%. So, I'll pause for a minute and then I'll have you write it down, guys, and then I'll share uh, with you. So write down the null and the alternative and tell me where the claim is in HO or HA. Just take about one minute to do it. So is 61% is right here in the null and this is the claim and not equal 61%. Yep. No, HO is the equal, HA is does not equal. Remember guys, HO has only those signs. This, that, or the third one. HA, I'm gonna keep reminding you, this one, that one, or this one. You cannot mix them up. This is what HO can have, and this is what HA can have. A car dealership announced that the mean time for an oil change is less than 15 minutes. Okay, a few seconds, guys. Write it down, and then I'll write it. It's the mean. Okay, I'll pause for a few seconds. Okay, less than 15 is going to go here, guys. Not because he says less than 15, you have to put it in the uh, null hypothesis. Whatever it falls, if it falls in the alternative, you put it in the alternative, and then you put what the null would be. So whatever he says, decide, does it, should it be in HO or HA? If it is in HA, put it in HA, guys. If it is in HO, put it in HO, and then write you know, the, the opposite statement. So the claim here is right here. Next one. Census Bureau data show that the mean household income in the area served by a shopping mall is 72,500 per year. 
a market research firm questions 100 shoppers at the mall to find out whether the mean household income of mall shoppers is higher than that of the general population. Okay, write them down, guys. What is the null and what is the alternative? Okay, mean, it's about the mean. And how do you, just you saw me, I, I forgot to mention you put column here. So you put H O H capital O column. Seventy two thousand five hundred and less than or equal to seventy two thousand five hundred. And the claim guys happen to be in H shape. Next one. Last year your company's service technicians took on an average of one point eight hours to respond to trouble calls from business customers who had purchased service contracts. Do this year data show a different average response time? That's a claim. Is the response time different from last year? How would you write this one, guys? I'm not gonna write it. I'm just gonna state H O and H A column, column mean, mean. So it's equal to for H. Yes, exactly. Equal to 1.8 not equal to 1.8 but can you guys tell me what is the claim here do this year's data show a different average response time where is the claim h or ha h, -O -H, -A. h -A. what do you guys do you guys agree it's h a because he's asking if it is different this year yeah I hope that you guys have a good feeling of how to pick up the null and the alternative because that's really my goal for uh, today, mainly that you pick up this. What I like you to do after we're done today, just go back, you know, just and review those notes. They're very, very important. Number five, a manufacturer claims of tires, it claims that less than 3% of their tires are defective. See, that's a claim. You don't have to support it. You have to study it and see if you can support it or not. What letter do I use here? Mu, P, or Sigma? P. P. I agree. P it is. How do you know to use P? Because it says percent. Oh, okay. Once it is a percent, it is, it is a proportion. It says less than 3%. So you guys agree with me that the less than 3% should be in HA? And that's the claim. And then greater than or equal to 3%. Any questions so far, guys? Okay, let's move on. Still have more examples. A senator running for office again claims that he has majority of voters. Okay, guys, take a second to uh, to do this and let me know. I'll pause for 15 seconds. Okay, majority means the proportion is more than one half, 50%. So it's a P. And the opposite, it will fall in the alternate uh, in the null hypothesis. Number seven, the standard deviation of waiting time at a restaurant is 12 minutes. Okay, guys, 
write it down. I hope that you're taking notes, not just watching me and we're doing some work with me. That will help a lot, guys, rather than just listening to me uh, demonstrating the stuff. At least uh, you will find out whether you grasp you know, the material or not when you try with me when I ask you to participate. Okay, this is sigma now, guys. It's a standard deviation. Don't put mu, don't put p. That would be wrong, guys, if you do this. So H-O, H-A, sigma, sigma. So sigma equals 12, I agree. And what is the opposite of equal, guys? You should know it by heart now, not equal 12 minutes. Now, where is the claim in H or H A? Okay, it's right here, the claim in H O. Okay, it is 50% because uh, majority means over 50%. That's what majority means. Minority is less than 50%. Majority means over 50%. That's why we use 50%. Or you can put a half. All right, guys. So this is how you state the null and the alternative hypothesis. And no worry, we're going to have some more uh, questions and stating the null and the alternative. It is a five-step process. So if you guys know how to state the null and the alternative hypothesis, you already guarantee 20% of the grade on the question because each, each step usually is 20% of the grade. So uh, understanding how to state the null and the alternative hypothesis is the first step. And uh, make sure you know how to identify uh, the claim, whether it is in HO or HA. If he makes a statement that has an equal sign, a claim that has an equal sign, then you know the claim is in HO. If he makes a, a claim that has a greater than sign, then you know the claim is in HA. So it's very simple to determine where the claim is. Because we're doing statistics, because we're using samples, there is a chance of making a mistake always. So types of errors I'm going to discuss uh, with you here. No matter which hypothesis represents the claim, always begin the hypothesis test assuming that the null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. So we agree on this. We begin the hypothesis test with the assumption that HO is true until we prove otherwise. At the end of the test, one of two decisions must be made. You either reject the null hypothesis or what? Fail to reject the null hypothesis. So you guys, you're learning all of this. You're going to learn the hypothesis testing procedures only to learn how to make one of two decisions. Do I reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis? If you end up rejecting the null hypothesis, you support the alternative hypothesis. Because if you reject one, that means the second one is true, guys. So if you reject the fact it is raining today, that means it is not raining. And if you reject, you know, the fact that X equals seven, you say this is not true, that means X is not seven. This is how we're gonna uh, proceed with hypothesis testing. So we either reject HO or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we'll, you will learn how to make one of those two decisions. This will be step number four. As I told you, there are five steps. You already learned the step number one. This is step number four, it will come later. Because your decision is based on a sample, there is a possibility of making the wrong decision. So I'm gonna tell you what a type one error is and what type two error and then go back and fill in the table. So a type one error, this is a mistake, occurs when you reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact true. Do you agree with me guys that this is a mistake when you reject something that is true? Like you, like you tell me two plus two equals four and I reject that. That is a mistake from my side. So, this is called type one error in statistics. 
when you reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact true. That is a mistake, it's called type one error. Let me tell you what type two error is. When you fail to reject HO, the null hypothesis, when it is in fact false. Do you guys agree with me if you fail to reject an argument that is false, that you'd made a mistake? Like someone is telling me uh, uh, two plus two is not equal to four and then I really agree, this is a false statement and I fail to reject it. I say, yeah, yeah, probably right. I mean, we're going to the extreme here, but this is just an example here. So when you fail to reject something that is false, you made a mistake. So somebody gives you false information, you agree to it, this is a type two error. Some, somebody gives you correct information, you disagree with it, that's a type one error. That is what type one and type two. Okay, let's go back to this table guys and please help me uh, fill in the blanks here. If HO is true, guys, and you don't reject it, did you make a correct decision here? It is true and you don't reject something that is true. You're not supposed to reject anything that is true. You're supposed to accept it. So you don't reject HO, you accept it. It means you accept it. Is that, is that okay here? What do you guys think? Yeah. Yes, that is a correct decision. Okay, let's look. Now here, HO is true, but you reject it. What happens here, guys? Which type of type error? error? Type one type error, one. very good. Good. Next one. HO is false and you don't reject it. Take two air. Excellent. And let's see the last one, guys. HO is false and you say, I don't want it, it's false. You reject it. What do you think you did, guys? You did the right thing here. It is correct decision. Next, I'm gonna show you guys the impact of type one and type two errors. And that's why it is important to try to minimize those type of errors. I want you to see this example right now. The USDA limit for salmonella contamination for chicken is 20%. A meat inspector reports that the chicken produced by a company exceeds the USDA limit. Okay, first of all guys, we need to write the null and the alternative hypothesis. The inspector claims that the company exceeds the USDA limit. It is a percentage of contamination. So we're gonna put a P. Oops, yeah. P, H O, let me write H O here. And H A. Okay, can you guys help me write the null and the alternative here? It says, the inspector says that the percentage of contamination exceeds what they allow, which is the 20%. What does the word exceed mean? Greater than or greater equal? Greater than. That's the claim, guys. And you know the null hypothesis is less than. Remember how mom said, all right. What is type one error, guys? What, what does it mean to you if you make a type one error here? What does it mean? State the type one error. 
the by definition type one error is when you reject the null hypothesis when it is what in fact what is true so type one error means here actually the percent of contamination is less than or equal to 20 percent but we reject this but we say it is more so i'm gonna write it down percent of contamination is less than or equal to 20 percent but we reject this fact what is type 2 error type 2 by definition fail to reject ho when it is false so can someone tell me in your own words what would be type 2 error to you so remember definition type 2 is when you fail to reject ho when it is false so ho is false so when you choose ho when ha is true or when you say that um, the proportion is less than or equal to 20 when it's really greater than greater, 20 exactly exactly You are falsely saying that the proportion of contamination is less than or equal twenty percent when it is in fact the greater. Greater than 20%. Which type of error is more serious guys? In this case, and explain. We're gonna do some brainstorming. Which one do you guys, you can live with and which one type of error you cannot live with committing you know just that mistake there is one that is dangerous and there is one that is a lot more dangerous than the other type one is more dangerous no type one it says let me tell you what type one it says the percent of contamination is less than 20 percent but the inspector you know rejected that fact What's going to happen when the inspector, you know, comes to the supermarket, to the meat market and tell him that your contamination level is more than 20%? What is it that going to do with the chicken? They're going to take it off the shelf, right? So they will take the chicken off the shelf because the inspector says he believes the contamination level is less than, uh, more than 20%. They'll take it off the shelf and they lose money. But look what type 2 error says. You are falsely saying that the proportion of contamination is less than 20%. So the inspector checks the meat. He didn't find anything wrong. When there is something wrong with it, the contamination level is more than 20%. So what's going to happen to people when they buy this meat and eat it? They're going to get what? They're going to get sick, right? So which one is more dangerous? The type 2 error is more dangerous because... You're putting, you're putting stuff on the shelves that uh, should not be there and people are going to buy them. They're going to get sick. Probably some people will die, you know, as a result of this. So type two error here is more serious because it's going to cause harm to people. Type two is more serious because it will cause harm to people. The other one is going to cause harm, but to the business, the business is going to lose money. Remember, there is money, losing money or losing lives, you know, so losing lives, you know, just is more serious than uh, losing money. So this is an example of type one and type two. Do mistakes happen in statistics? Definitely. I, the reason why I'm doing this is just to let you know that there are type one and type two error. You don't go, you will not come across those errors yourselves as you do the hypothesis test, but you just need that they uh, need to know that they do exist.
We do make mistakes. Even when we make decision, it is possible that we've made a mistake. Some more definitions, guys, here. As I told you, the first section is uh, quite a bit of uh, definitions in here. So I'm going to tell you what the level of significance is. OK. Level of significance. It is your maximum allowable probability of my making a type 1 error. So you have a leverage to make type one error and that should not exceed a certain amount. It is denoted by alpha, the lowercase Greek letter alpha. The level, the common level of significance guys are 10%, 5% and 1%. So 10% means your maximum allowable probability of making type one error. You cannot exceed 10%. So you have 10% chance of making type one error you have up to 5% uh, chance of making type one error. You have uh, up to 1% chance of making type one error. In medical research guys or uh, studies, uh, the FDA requires alpha to be at 1% because they wanna minimize type one error as much as possible. So they require the study to be done at the 1% level of significance. But for your information, there are three common values of alpha that you're going to come across and you learn later how to use them uh, uh, in the process of hypothesis testing. They're 1%, 5%, and 10%. So uh, by setting the level of significance at a small value, you are saying that you want the probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis to be small. So we always want to make sure that we don't make mistakes and we try to minimize those mistakes. So you will not see any exercise in the book that allow you more than 10% of making a type one error. So it's 10% or less. You might see some alphas in the book at 2%, but the most common ones guys are one, five and 10. If you want to link them to chapter six, the 10%, can you guys guess what confidence level it links? Any ideas? You should be able to tell. 90? 90, because 10 plus 90 is 100%. And the 5% guys links to 95%, and the 1% links to 99%, exactly. But these are... Oh, yeah, you do have one of them. All right, statistical tests. Okay, how we're gonna perform the hypothesis? We haven't got there yet. You guys learned how to perform step number one, state the null and the alternative hypothesis. When we test the mean, we're gonna find X bar, the sample mean. We're gonna need the sample mean in order to test the mean. It's just like you did in chapter six, guys. You had X bar. so. For the population mean, we're gonna find X bar or we'll be given X bar. This is called the test statistic. When you do the proportion, guys, we're gonna do P hat. And if you still remember what P hat was in chapter six, it was X over N. We're gonna need this to test that. And when we test the standard deviation, guys, I'm gonna make it sigma instead of sigma square, we're gonna need S. So to test the population standard deviation, we need the sample standard deviation. All of this information will be given to you guys in order to perform uh, your uh, test. Now, uh, before I get to the p-value, I'm gonna pause for one second and I'm gonna make you watch a short video on the p-value. So just, Give me one minute, guys, to get the video ready and have you watch it, and then we'll comment on it once it's done. It's only two or three minute video, so just one second. Let me pause the recording for now. Test the meaning of the p-value. Whenever we use Excel or other computer packages to analyze data, one of the key outputs is the p-value, or SIG. In formal terms, the p-value is the probability that, if a null hypothesis were true, Sampling variation would produce an estimate that is further away from the hypothesized value than our data estimate. 
In less formal terms, the p-value tells us how likely it is to get a result like this if the null hypothesis is true. We will now go through this step by step with an example. Helen sells chocolatees. Recently, she has received complaints that the chocolatees have fewer peanuts in them than they are supposed to. So guys, the claim is that Helen received a complaint that her cho chocolate contains less nuts, you know, than the, than she uh, she put, you know, just on the package. So, and then she's gonna try to verify this if this claim is valid or not. The packet says that each 200 gram packet of chocolate nutties contains 70 grams of peanuts or more. Helen can't open up all the packets to check, as then she wouldn't be able to sell any. So she decides to use a statistical test on a. So, did you guys understand what the, she says here? She sells Chucky Nutties and she claims that she put 70 grams, you know, just of nuts or more in each pack. She's not gonna open every single pack and check, you know, just how much, you know, just nuts are in there. Otherwise, she spoil every single one. So she's gonna collect a sample and then she's gonna check, you know, just the results, you know, of the sample. A sample of the packets. The null hypothesis, often called H0, is the thing we are trying to provide evidence against. For Helen, the null hypothesis is that the chocolatees are as they should be. The mean or average weight of peanuts in the packet is 70 grams. The alternative hypothesis, called H1 or HA, is what we're trying to prove. The customers have complained that the weight of peanuts is less than what it should be. So the alternative hypothesis is that the average weight of peanuts is less than 70 grams. Helen decides to use a significance level of 0 0.05. If the p-value is lower than this, she will reject the null hypothesis. Okay, the way it's gonna uh, work, guys, she's gonna find this p-value, which I'm gonna give you some more details about it. And we compare the p-value with the level of significance that I told you about a few minutes ago. If the p-value less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is more than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This is how things work in hypothesis testing. So let's watch and see what Helen is gonna do next. Having decided on few hypotheses and on the significance level, Helen takes a random sample of 20 packets of choconutties from her current stock of 400 packets. She melts down the choconutties and weighs the peanuts from each packet. If all of the values were lower than 70 grams, with a mean of 30 grams for instance, it would be quite obvious that the bars do not have the required number of peanuts. It is really unlikely that you will get 20 packets with a mean of 30 grams if the overall mean of all the packets in the population is 70 grams. Conversely, if all the values of the 20 packets were much higher than 70 grams, it would be obvious that there were enough peanuts and that there was nothing to complain about. Do you guys understand what she, uh, they're saying now? If she says, if she picks 20 packs and she finds out that there is so much, you know, just nuts in there, I don't think the customer who are complaining, you know, just have a basis of their claim. If, the, if you get like 80 gram, 96, 73, but that's not the case either. So let's see what she came up with. However, in this case, the 20 packets contain the following weights of peanuts, and the mean is 68.7 grams. This caused Helen to ask herself, does this provide enough evidence that the bars are short of peanuts, or could this result just be from luck? She asks her brother to use Excel to find the p-value for this data, comparing with a mean of 70 grams. The p-value is 0.18. Judging from the data that we have, there is an 18% chance of getting a mean as low as this or lower if there is nothing wrong with the bars. That is, if the null hypothesis is true and the mean weight of nuts is 70 grams or more. This p-value of 0.18 does not provide enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. In this case, Helen does not have evidence to say that the bars are short of peanuts. This is a relief. The smaller the p-value is, the less likely it is that the result we got was simply a result of luck. If the p-value had turned out to be very small, we then would say that the result was significantly different from 70 grams. In general, we start by... All right, I'm gonna stop sharing here, go back, and then I'll elaborate on what she says. But just to see, probably you didn't get the idea of the p-value yet, which I'm gonna explain now but just to give you an idea how important uh, the p-value and this is a claim that the p-value was used you know to either verify you know just support the claim or go against the claim so i'm going to stop sharing here and go back to my other screen all 
All right. So I'm going to explain uh, the p value, guys, with a sketch. Just make sure that you understand that one. And then to find the p-value, guys, you're gonna see how easy it is to find the p-value later on the uh, calculator. Okay, so let me just do a sketch here and explain the p-value. So. so we have, I'm just going to do three examples and tell you what the p-value is in each example. Mean equal 15, mean not equal 15. Mean is less than or equal to 15, mean is greater than 15. I'm going to do all the scenarios for you guys. And please pay good attention to this because once you pick it up, once you're just going to be doing the same thing every time. And let's say the claim is here claim in the alternative and claim here. And let's say alpha is 0.05. You notice Helen used alpha equals 0.05. So how do we find the p-value? Look, how do we find the p-value? He will give you a sample size. Let's say he gives us a sample size n equals 27. He will give you x bar, a sample mean, Let's say the sample mean, guys, is uh, 16.5. And he will give you a standard deviation. Let's say the standard deviation, I'm just making up the stuff, 1.2, okay? What I like you to do, guys, to help me change X bar to a Z score, to a test statistic, which is called Z score. And the formula for it, it's X bar, minus mean divided by sigma over square root of n, if you remember that from a chapter uh, five. So how do I change all those values to what we call a test statistic z? x bar is given to me, it's 16.5 minus the mean. We say we assume that the null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. So we're gonna use 15 here over Sigma, 1.2 over the sample size, which is square root of 27. Can you guys help me just change? You won't, be, you won't need to do any of this work by hand, but just to show you what the p-value is, uh, let me just do this calculation here. You can work with me on this calculation as well. So I got 16.5 minus 5 is 1.5. And here's how I would enter this into the calculator. 1.5 divided by open parentheses for the denominator. I have 1.2 divided by square root of 27. All right, and then go out and close this. Okay, I got 6.49. Okay, let me explain what the p-value is. So once you change the x-bar value to a z-score, I will explain, you know, just I can explain what the p-value is. And let's say you have here n equals 20, different problem. So we're just gonna do a three scenarios and show you what the p-value is in each one. Let's say he gives you n equals 20, he gives you x-bar equals 16.2, he gives you sigma to be 0 0.5. Let's find z again. It will be x bar minus mean divided by sigma over square root of n. And what would that be, guys? x bar is 16.2 minus the mean. We assume it is, we assume the null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. So we take always the value here and put it there divided by sigma, which is 0 0.5. Helen didn't do any of that work because her brother used Excel and you will be using TI-84, you know, to, count, to compute those values over square root of 20. So let me see what this one is gonna be, uh, guys. 16.2 minus 15 is 1.2 divided by 0 0.5 over square root of 20. And uh, 
you guys can help me find those values. Yes, we always assume the value in the null hypothesis is true. No matter what the value is, you take it. Exactly, yes. In this case, it is 15. I'm just using 15. Whatever you have in the null hypothesis, you put it right here, always. So 1.2. I have a student asking me if we assume always uh, the value in the null hypothesis is true. Yes, we do, because that's, that's a requirement of the hypothesis test. So we got 1.2 divided by... 0 0.5 over square root of 27. Uh, not 27, 20 here, sorry. All right, I'm gonna close here and see what the answer is. I got 10.7, that's a very high Z-score, okay. And the third one, guys, let me just prepare those and then I'll sketch the p-value for you. Let's make n equals uh, 11. I'm just making stuff up. X bar is 15.2. Sigma is 0 0.4. And let's find Z. It will be X bar 15.2. Now I'm going to make it 14.9. 14.9 minus 15 divided by 0 0.4 divided by square root of 11. Okay, help me compute this, guys. 14.9 minus 15 is negative 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.4 over square root of 11. Okay, let's see what this one is. So if I do 0 0.1 divided, open parentheses, put 0 0.4 divided by square root of 11. Okay, I got negative 0.83. Excellent. Okay. Now, guys, just spare... Uh, few minutes and then I should be able, you know, just to touch on the critical value. If you have HA with a different from sign, this is called the two-tailed test. Why they call it two-tailed test? Because a different from 15 means it could be more than 15 or could be less than 15. So we call it two-tailed test. If you have a greater than 15 in the alternative hypothesis, guys, it's called the right tail test. It's one tail and it's a right tail test. Why it is called the right tail test? Because more than 15, you go to the right. When you count, you know more than 15. So this is called right tail test. If you have a less than, guys, this is called the left tail test. And it's one tail left tail test. So let me demonstrate the p-value and each one of them. It is a normal population. This is the mean right here, which is the 15 that we're claiming right here. Okay. Uh, if I change this to a z-score, this will become a zero, as you know, for z. So this is a z, zero. Okay. And let me, 10.73 on the number line, guys, where would that be? To the right of zero or to the left of zero? Where would Z be if I want to place Z on the number line? This is one, this is two, this is three. You go negative one, negative two, up to three standard deviation. At 10.73, guys, it will be somewhere here. Okay, and let me tell you what the p-value is. If it is a right tail test, guys, I'm doing the second one right now. If it is a right tail test, the p-value is the area to the right of z. Right here. Can you guys guess this is the area to the right of z right here? 
Can you guys guess, do you have any idea what the area is gonna be? It's from 0% to 100%. Any guesses what do you think the area would be? It's way, way to the right because the three will take me almost to the end. So imagine 10.73, where is it going to be? Any guesses what do you think the p-value would be? How small would that be? Would someone make a prediction, uh, an estimation of the p-value? Just give me some numbers between zero and one. Any guesses? Remember, the 10.73 is way, way toward the right, you know, just of the tail. Oh, this is very small. Remember, it's an area to the right, and there is almost nothing here, guys, because it's the tail almost touching here. So I would say it's going to be very, very small. So p-value here is area to the right of z equals 10.73. How do you find this area, guys? You did it in chapter five yesterday when we did, uh, when you did the test. If I wanna find the area above 10.73, you go to normal CDF, let's find it. This is the p-value. Second, distribute, normal CDF. I'm sure many of you uh, did that. So to the right of 10.73, can you help me guys? It will be 10.73 comma what? A million? One. Million, then comma zero, comma one. Okay, you will see how small it's gonna be guys. Do you see the value? It says 3.767E negative 27. It means you have to move the decimal place 27 digits to the left, so it's gonna be almost zero. Normal CDF, I write it down. 10.73, a uh, thousand or a million, zero one, which is almost zero, guys. Okay. So that we know what the p-value is, it's almost zero. Let's do it for this one, guys. Now I'm gonna do it for this. This is the curve. This is the z line, this is z. Negative 0 0.83, guys, will be somewhere here. And the p-value, it's because it's a left tail test, it will be an area to the left of z. Negative 0 0.83, let's do it together. Normal CDF, I'll go back. Okay, can you guys help me? Uh, just did it two days ago. Uh, what is the lower bound? Negative a million, comma, negative 0 0.83, comma, zero comma one. It's not gonna be as small as the previous one, guys. It won't be as small. So I got 0 0.2033. 0 it is big, it's not small. Let's go to this one, show you how to find the p-value. It's a two-tailed test. This is zero right here. This is the Z line. Okay. I have Z equals 6.49. Because it's a two tail test, the p-value will be split on the two sides. And this will be the Z equals 6.49. And this will be the Z equals negative 6.49. They're symmetric. All you need guys to do is find the p-value on one, the, the area on one side and multiply the answer by two to find the p-value. So let's do it for this one to the right of 6.49, that will be normal CDF. It's gonna be almost zero again. You get 6.29, you get a million or a thousand, and then you put zero and one, okay. I'm gonna do it and show you what the p-value is. Second and distribute, normal CDF. Okay, I got 6.29 to begin with, comma, million, comma, zero, comma, one. You won't need to find the p-value this way, but 
Okay, it's 1.59 e to the negative 10, almost zero. So you can say the p-value is zero. Okay. How do we make a decision about the null hypothesis, whether we reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis? What is alpha in the problem that I proposed here, guys? It's 0 0.05. If your p-value is less than alpha, you reject HO, as simple as that. If your p-value is more than alpha, you fail to reject HO. This is how easy it is to make a decision about the null hypothesis. Okay, what is the p-value in the first uh, example I bet? It's 0 0.00, and alpha is 5%. Do you guys agree with me that 0, 0.00 is less than 5%, so then we reject HO. In this example here, the p-value was zero, which is less than 5%, uh, we reject HO. But look here, if you have this example, the p-value here turned out to guys to be 0 0.2033. Remember, these are three different problems. 0 0.2033 is more than 5%, then you say, I fail to reject uh, HO. Now, what I'm gonna show you here, uh, before we proceed, just to give you a glance at what you expect to see tomorrow. Rather than doing any of the work I did here, we're just gonna go to this feature here, stat, tests, watch guys, the first one, Z test. Okay, let me go to this exercise and watch with me guys how uh, easy it is to perform the test and find the p-value once you know how to state the null and the alternative hypothesis. So let's say the null hypothesis is mean greater than or equal to 15 and here the mean is less than 15 and he gives you sample size 11, X bar 14.9 and sigma 0.4. And because he gives me sigma the population standard deviation, I'm using a Z test here. Let's see if you have any questions here. Okay. So watch guys, mu zero, what do you put in mu zero? Put the value from the null hypothesis, which is 15 right here, sigma. What did he say sigma is 0 0.4? X bar, what did he give us X bar 14.9? So all the work I did by hand, you will see the calculator can perform. N is 11, okay. Now let me tell you before, before we hit calculate what he wants you to do. He wants you to select the sign that you see in the alternative hypothesis. So can you guys tell me which sign do I select, the first, second, or third? So before you hit calculate, it's, it's the sign in the alternative hypothesis. So let me see, as long as one student does it right, I'll keep going. The second one, I agree, very good. You have to. This is why, guys, it's extremely critical that you learn how to set up the null in the alternative hypothesis because if you don't set him up right, you're gonna put the wrong uh, statement here before you hit calculate and you're gonna get totally uh, wrong results. So we're gonna select the second one and press enter and watch guys. What the calculator is gonna do, is gonna do two steps for you that, are, that take most of the time to get the work done. So watch, calculate, okay. It gave me Z, the test statistic. It changed, you know, X bar to a standardized test score, which is Z equal negative 0.83. See guys, all the work I did here to do it. You see the negative 0.83, it's already done on your calculator right here. And look what it gives me also. It gives me the p-value. What does the calculator say for the p-value? 0.2035, that's what I got, guys, very close if you look at my answer right here. Because we rounded, we got 0.2033, but the calculator answer is even more accurate, which is 0.2035. So the calculator will give you the p-value. Now, guys, your turn is to look at alpha and ask yourself if the p-value is less than alpha or more than alpha. If your p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null hypothesis. If your p-value is more than alpha, 
you fail to reject the null hypothesis. So, so far, guys, I've gone with you through four steps, not the last step about the claim. First step is to state the null and the alternative hypothesis, which we did some practice with. The second step is to change the information that he gives you and the problem to a test statistic, which we call it Z, and you learned how to do that with Z. Then the step number three is to find the p-value. Well, the calculator will do step two and step three for us. Step four, make a decision to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Well, in our case, guys, because p equals 0.2035, which is more than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And step number five, I'll talk about that one later. But before I wrap this up, guys, I wanna show you also that how I could have gotten the results of this one using the calculator. So just let me uh, demo this and show you. If you have your calculator handy, and we will be done. I, I, I just ask you to go about 10, 15 minutes beyond in each session to make up for uh, what we lost. So just a few more minutes and I'll be done, guys. So let's go to stat, tests, and z-test. Okay, z-test stands for testing the mean when the population standard deviation is known. You notice, guys, I gave you sigma here. That means population standard deviation is known. I gave you sigma in the second one and I gave you sigma in the third one. So that's why we are performing z-test. Just like z-interval and t-interval, it's the same thing. So watch, z-test, stats. Okay, mu 0, 15, that doesn't change. I still have 15. Sigma, yeah, it changes. I give you a different sigma here, it's 1.2. X-bar, I gave you 16.5. And then uh, N is 27. And different from, now you need to choose the sign from the alternative hypothesis, which is not equal to, okay? And then hit calculate and watch guys, you're gonna get the same results that I got. Z is 6.495, look what we got, exactly the same. And the P value guys, it's 8.33 E negative 11. E negative 11 means move the decimal point 11 digits to the left. So you're gonna end up with four zeros. And that's what I ended up with the p-value, which is less than alpha. So that would be 